fear. It's a basic human emotion. What frightens you more? The evil that you know? Or the evil that you don't know? There have been many influential FPS games, from Doom to Quake to Half-Life 1 and 2, and more. However, one of the last FPS games that was truly influential was Fear. Fear released in 2005 to critical acclaim. To me, it was a great mix of old school shooters combined with some new school shooter mechanics. And it actually worked, surprisingly. It sold well enough to get a few expansion packs, and even two sequels. So clearly this game had some good points going for it. But how does it hold up all these years later? There are many things to discuss about Fear, so I think a good place to start would be the very beginning of the game, and work our way up from there. Bearing in mind, there will be spoilers in this video. Fear begins with a cutscene showing a character named Paxton Fedor going crazy and taking control of a battalion of telepathically controlled clone super soldiers. Wow, that's a mouthful. This gives him full control of a facility known as the Armachan Technology Corporation Structure, or ATCS, and kills everyone inside. You play as the Point Man a newly recruited member of the first Encounter Assault Recon team. Nobody seems to take this team seriously, as they are basically militarized versions of the Ghostbusters. Though I have no idea if this team is government funded, or if it is a team acting upon its own accord, but that doesn't matter. You are given a briefing about the situation, and are introduced to the members of your team. They have given you the role of the point man, as your reflexes are fast, like Max Payne fast only even faster. You're putting him in the field? Are you crazy? He just transferred in a week ago. You've seen his training results. His reflexes are totally off the charts. I think he can handle himself. Whatever, man. It's your call. Goddamn right it is. Fear locates Fedel by a satellite tracking device, and the main objective is to kill him, which will separate the link between the replicas that are telepathically linked. Fear first tracks Fettel to the South River Wastewater Treatment Plant. Gee, some of these names are tongue twisters. As they head inside, it is made very clear that there is some paranormal activity in this place. A creepy girl with a red dress and long hair, just like in The Ring. Only in The Ring it was wearing a white dress. This is Alma. She is kind of like the G-Man from Half-Life, where she pops up sometimes just out of range and then disappears. She is the most important aspect of the story, but more on that later. She makes an appearance in this easter egg where if you keep opening and closing the doors, then your heads up display will then flicker, and then the door disappears with Alma standing in the corner. Proceeding to the door will cause this to happen. It may sound confusing at first, but it makes sense later. Your teammate Spencer, who doesn't think very highly of you, catches up and lets you in. Eventually you come to a body and Spencer calls for backup from Jin, who is this woman in the intro. The point man is ordered to move on ahead by himself. There is a jump scare here, which I don't think is the best way to start. I hate fake jump scares and this is a fake jump scare in a video game, as it doesn't really cause any problems for the player. How much creepier would it be if there wasn't this loud, annoying sound, and instead you just saw a pair of legs walk by, and you hear footsteps slowly dissolve as they get further and further away? It's an issue I have that persists throughout this game. There are certain scenes that are meant to be jump scares, and have really loud noises playing, but it would be scarier if there wasn't any noises playing, and it was complete silence. While we're here though, Fear looks fantastic for a game released in 2005. The footage you're seeing here was recorded on medium settings, and it looks real nice. The wall textures especially look great, and on max settings, this game looks gorgeous. Anyway, after walking around on the roof for a bit, you come across to this area where you get hit in the- Ah! Paxton Fettel talks about a man who was a part of the operation, and that Fettel was involved in it, and how he deserved to die, and how everyone involved deserves to die. He also hints at being linked towards Alma. But are the memories mine or hers? After that, you return to your squad mates and move out to find Fedel. You arrive, fully armed to the teeth, with a full squad to back you up. 
The gate is locked and you have to find a switch to open it. Once walking back you hear gunshots and the music starts to build up and then skeletons! Perfect! Only then the game shows you what happened. Ugh, why? The atmosphere you built up was just perfect and I have to go ruin the mystery? It's scary when you come back and everyone's skeletons and you're wondering if you accidentally put in the VHS for Raiders of the Lost Ark, but then you go and ruin the mystique by showing us what happened. I thought this game was supposed to be named Fear. Fear of the Unknown is probably the most common fear and it is what a lot of horror movies are built upon. For example, the original Halloween is built entirely upon suspense. We never find out who or what Michael Myers is. Dr. Samuel Loomis says that he is nothing but pure evil. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. He's known as The Shape, implying that nothing exists beneath that Captain Kirk face other than mass. He appears to be indestructible and insanely strong and he also appears to be unbeatable. What makes him scary is that we have no actual idea what he is. The remake of Halloween spent half the film going over Michael Myers' backstory trying to make him a relatable character. Because we now know every single detail of The Shape, he's no longer scary. In fact, he's no longer even The Shape. It just goes to show that sometimes a simple and mysterious brooch can be the best. The scares and fear are about as subtle as a nuclear bomb and it's why I don't particularly find this game scary. At all. But this is where we get to our first combat encounter which leads me into the most praised aspect of fear. The gameplay. Or more specifically, the artificial intelligence. A lot of people say that every FPS game should take inspiration from fear for its AI. But that's silly. There is no definitive way to do AI in a video game and, and narrowing it down to one very specific thing limits creativity, but I do agree that there are certain things that AI has to 100% accomplish in a video game, and I do think that some shooters can take inspiration from fear. The main things I personally think AI should accomplish is a few things, however it isn't limited just to this. AI should provoke creativity from the player, it should force them to use their critical thinking skills in order to beat the game. It's very satisfying to the human brain when it feels smart and like it actually accomplished something, so the AI should provoke creativity. Another thing that ties into that is decision making. The AI should give the player a multitude of different options and ways of playing the game and it's the player's job to weigh up the outcomes of each option and whether or not it will get the player to where they need and want to go. This also means that the player has to have something to bounce off of. The AI has to give the player something to react to that then causes the player to make tough decisions and use their critical thinking skills in order to accomplish their goals. It may sound like I'm generalizing a bit, which I kind of am, but I think you get the idea. In case you didn't, I'm going to go in more detail anyway. One of the things that's most important to get right in a video game is making sure your AI is beatable. Now I know most people are going to think I'm talking about just killing the enemy, but that's not entirely just beating it. Beating it could be outsmarting the enemy, sneaking around the enemy, trapping the enemy, and many other things. It is not relegated to just killing them. The reason why you need to make sure your AI is beatable is because even though you need to have a challenge in your game, it is not really a challenge if the challenge cannot be beaten. It's like making a wall that is impossible to climb. There's no challenge because you will never be able to climb it. But how do you make your AI beatable but also challenging? Well, it's simple. The AI has to have limitations, and so does the player. You have to decide what the player can do and what it can't do. For example, in Fear, you can crouch, slide, do a bicycle kick, and use weaponry. What you can't do is stuff like jumping off walls or going prone. In real life, a regular person would be capable of this, but the problem is that if you allow the player to do almost anything, then the gameplay becomes completely unpredictable. And the same goes for the AI. If they are able to do literally anything and were 100% unpredictable, then your gameplay and level design is going to suffer as you have no idea on how the game might actually play out. Having limitations allows you to be more aware of what you can and can't do in game design. In a game like Fear, since you have limitations, and the AI has limitations, it means that developers can design the level in a way so that it will work no matter how you choose to play it. 
because in a shooter game, level design and AI should go hand in hand. If one falters, then so will the other. Fear does this very well. Most combat encounters give you multiple ways to enter the battle and give you areas to move around without making the level design so open that it takes forever to engage in combat. Most of the game takes place in areas like office complexes or streets or underground facilities. Fear's combat works best at close range as a majority of the guns have terrible accuracy and reticle bloom, which means that as you shoot the gun it becomes less accurate. Although I'm not sure why moving around makes the gun less accurate. I mean, I know it's easier to aim when you're standing still and not moving around, but guns don't just magically become less accurate because you move around. It's also great because the melee attacks in this game are an actual part of the combat instead of just being an afterthought or only used in the first couple levels. Since a lot of the player will be using a combination of both shooting and meleeing, it's good to have areas where the player can take full advantage of that. Sophia clearly knows what it's doing in terms of design. The AI in Fear has been said by many to be the most advanced AI in video game history, but it really isn't. Fear's AI is good, don't get me wrong, but there is some smoke and mirrors involved in making the AI seem so good. The main thing that makes Fear's AI seem so good is the dialogue that enemies say. If the game knows that you're taking cover behind an object, then the game will play a line of dialogue to show that the enemy is aware of that, sometimes even specifically saying what you're hiding behind. Behind the pillar! However, that doesn't mean the AI is actually going to act upon that realization. The enemies will move around and try and attack the player, but it isn't because they're highly advanced. The enemies in Fear have the same issue that Halo Combat Evolved has. Great game, but the enemies in that game will just move around for seemingly no reason. But this is supposed to trick the player into thinking that the AI is actually moving around with purpose, when it's not. It's just moving around for the sake of it. A lot of the time in fear, enemies will just start randomly moving to areas which fools the player into thinking they're actually tactically evaluating how to take you down. They're not. A lot of the time, they're performing specific actions to make them seem more intelligent than they actually are. Once again, the dialogue will have enemies saying things like, he's hiding over there, or telling his fellow squadmates to shut up or even that the player is flanking them. But that isn't the AI being intelligent and actually reacting to what you're doing, the game is just acknowledging what the player is doing. But having the AI say things like this makes the player think as if the AI is actually going to use this to their advantage or that they'll change up their current tactics. They won't. For example, if there is one enemy left, then that enemy will acknowledge that fact and say things like, we can't stop him, which satisfies the player as they feel as if they're making the enemy scared of them. But the AI isn't actually scared of the player. It may act like it's scared, like running away whilst trying to shoot you, which makes you think that the enemy cares about saving its own life as much as it does killing about you, but this is simply an enemy moving to a certain location whilst performing an animation. It's done to make them seem like they're scared of you, but all they're really doing is just moving to another location. And finally, the enemies in fear seem like they're working together, but they're actually not. Once again, the dialogue fools you. The dialogue will make it seem like the squad is working together, but each enemy acts upon their own accord. Like an enemy might go in to flank the player and say something like, I'm going in, or watch my back, but the AI is simply just doing its own thing, and the game uses this dialogue to make it seem like the AI is actually working together when it's not. But I think Fear has a good structure of only fighting a squad of enemies at once instead of constantly having enemies spawn out of nowhere and attack the player. And now, like I said, I'm not saying that Fear's AI is bad, I'm just shutting down the myth, like many others have, that Fear's AI is super advanced. It isn't advanced at all, in fact. In most shooter games, including Fear, the AI mostly just comes down to moving to a specific location and then doing an animation and occasionally using an object in the environment. This is the basic structure of AI in Fear. Doesn't seem so advanced now, huh? Now, to Fear's credit, it did do something interesting with behavior trees, which will make the AI go to locations and perform specific animations based on the behavior to give the impression that each enemy has their own personality, but once again, even though this is great, it's still just moving and animating. But you have to convince the player that there is more going on than just moving and animating. So they use dialogue and they use these behavior trees, which fool the player into thinking that each replica is using critical thinking and decision-making just like you are. 
when in actuality it's just a computer telling an enemy to go to a location and perform one of multiple animations. Throwing a grenade at the player or shooting at the player for an AI is the same thing. It's something used to cause damage to the player, but for the player it's completely different and can lead to multiple different encounters. So in the end, it ends up making the enemies seem like they're doing more than they actually are. Fear passes this with flying colours. Look at all the people who actually think the game has advanced AI. The game did an excellent job fooling them. Another point to make is that if the player is doing something wrong, then you should make it very clear that they are doing something wrong. If you take damage in a game, then it should be your own fault, because taking damage for no good reason doesn't lead to very fun gameplay. So you have to make sure if the player fails, then it's their fault. And if they make a mistake, then you should make it very clear what the mistake was. For example, if the player is rushing in too fast with a shotgun, then you should make it very clear that these enemies can't be beaten with brute force. Part of beating a challenge is learning from your mistakes, and if you don't realise what those mistakes are, you're going to have a hard time learning from them. This also ties into risks versus rewards. If you want the player to be really risky and do super badass John Wick moves, then you have to have some kind of reward for it. In Fear's case, if you take high risk, you'll be able to take care of enemies faster and in a more efficient way whilst being awesome whilst you do it. So far, Fear has been doing really well in terms of level design and AI. What I like is that Fear's gameplay is simple but offers a lot of challenge. You can't make a game so complex that it requires a tutorial every five minutes. Fear tells you what you need to know and then lets you experiment with it. No two playthroughs of this game will ever be the exact same. There may be similarities, but the overall gameplay and combat encounters will play out differently each time, which makes the game very fun to replay. But finally, the main objective of an enemy is to neutralize threat, which involves, but isn't limited to, killing the player. It can be things like moving to cover or not getting too close to explosive objects. The enemy is still focused on the player, but they're also focusing on neutralizing threat. Fear once again succeeds at this. Enemies will run away from you if you get too close with a shotgun or jump through windows to get away from you, but the threat for them is only 100% gone once you're dead. Overall, Fear's basic AI works well and goes hand in hand with the level design. The level design in this game is solid for the most part, offering the player multiple routes to go, whilst also providing secrets and rewards for exploration. You can find guns, health boosters, health packs, reflex boosters, if you go and explore. Despite Fear being a linear game, I never feel as if I'm going just in a straight line. The only time the level design weakens is when it becomes a bit too open, like in Chapter 3. Fear's AI is designed for short to medium range encounters, so I don't know why they thought making a long ranged battle was a great idea. But the times this actually happens in the game can be counted on one hand. So overall, solid level design and solid AI. And if that isn't enough, then the game has bullet time, which gives you even more options than you previously had before. This also allows players to avoid taking damage in certain instances, and it means that they can take more risks without being blown apart right away. After that essay on fear, it's time to go over some of the more individual elements, like the separate guns and enemy types. For guns, you have your standard pistol, which can be dual wielded. I like the pistol, it's pretty accurate and does a lot of damage, but the downside is that later into the game it's harder to find ammo for it, and the enemies get tougher and start wearing much better armor, so it can feel a little bit underpowered as the game goes along. But running into a room full of bad guys and decimating the whole room with bullet holes never gets old. Next we have the submachine gun. It looks like an MP5, but a 20 minutes into the future version of it. It has good accuracy and can take out a group of bad guys from a medium distance, but at close range it isn't as effective. That's not to say it's useless, but if you want to use a machine gun at close range, then you better use the G2A2 assault rifle. The accuracy is awful, but it takes out enemies like they're just a sack of potatoes. But the ammo can run out very fast if you aren't using it effectively. There is also the ASP rifle, which uses a scope and fires in a burst so it's easy to control your shots. After that, there's the penetrator, which acts more like the crossbow from Half-Life 2, as it can stick enemies to walls. It is very accurate and does quite a bit of damage, but the downside is that the firing rate isn't as fast as other guns. I mean, it's not slow, but it's not anywhere near as fast as other guns in the game. Well, uh, what fear video would be fully in-depth if I didn't talk about the shotgun? The shotgun is often called one of the best shotguns in FPS history, and while it is insanely fun to shoot a dude point blank in the face and see his head go flying across the room, or even see his body tear off because of how powerful this thing is, 
I don't think it's one of the best shotguns, but that's just personal preference. There's also the repeater cannon, which fires incendiary rounds, which will blow up enemies in groups. It's awesome to use, and it makes you feel like an unstoppable badass, but it's only encountered towards the end of the game. There is one rifle which fires rockets, but the ammo for it is so scarce, I never had a full clip. It's fun to use against tougher enemies, but for the most part, I didn't use it. And finally, you have the Particle Gun, which one-shots almost any enemy. It's awesome to use, but they give you way too much ammo for it, and it means that later sections of this game can be made extremely easy if you're using this thing. I played on the hardest difficulty, like I do of all my reviews, and I do love the description of the extreme difficulty. Fear is a challenging game, but towards the end, it gets really easy. You also have stuff like frag grenades and sticky grenades. The sticky grenades can be useful for things like turrets, but other than that, I don't see much use for them. There's also mines, which sometimes work well and sometimes don't. Sometimes the enemy will walk right by it and doesn't do anything, yet sometimes if they get within two meters of the damn thing, it blows up. All in all, Fear's arsenal may not be perfect, but it's fun to use, and each gun can be used creatively and effectively, but they all have their flaws. The game allows you to carry three guns at once, which is similar to Halo, where you can only carry two guns at once. It means you have an arsenal that equips you for certain encounters without automatically giving you the upper hand. Now onto the enemies. The main enemy you encounter is the Replica Soldier, which I've already gone in depth about them all, so all you need to know is that they're fun to fight, and they force you to be creative and make tough decisions during combat. There is this heavy armor dude that takes a lot of firepower to put down. At times it can seem a bit unfair, as the weapons he carries can make you a corpse in like two seconds, but I found that explosives and shotguns seem to be the most useful weapons against him. But there are some areas where I feel like the player isn't given enough room to maneuver or plan out their next move. There are also just regular dudes that you fight, but uh, they feel just like a weaker version of the replicas, so they aren't interesting. I mean, they're fun to fight, but they don't really bring much variety to the gameplay. After that, we have the replica assassin. They have a cloaking mode and can sneak up on you real fast but you're the point man, so I'm sure you'll figure it out. I mean, I did. There is another enemy that I want to talk about, but uh, they don't really fit into this section. They fit more into the story section of fear. Speaking of which, let's get back into the story. The basic gist of the story is that you're trying to kill Paxton Fettel. You visit different locations and you meet different characters. Pretty stupid characters, I might add. I mean, there's this one woman who doesn't want to take the extraction helicopter because she's afraid of heights. So guess what she does? She decides to put the whole mission at risk and go down to the car park and drive away in a car only to then get captured and killed by Fedor. Seriously? I mean, I know being afraid of heights is a common thing, but I think any logical human being would be like, hey, I'd rather be under the protection of soldiers and body armor with guns than just in my car all by myself. It's just there to pad out the story. There's also this one guy who acts like a cartoon character. I mean, they even try and play some silly music when he appears. Tell you what, you disable the local security system, and I'll see what I can do about the server. I can disable it remotely once I'm logged in. No, you can't. It's on a separate network. Really send the tone, guys. <sighs> he also does stuff like ask you to turn off the security system in the building only for you to then turn it back on. I mean, how much padding out does this game have to have? I mean, the story of fear is just... meh. And the only parts I find interesting is the stuff to do with armor. Throughout the entire game you see hallucinations and dreams with armor in them. Oftentimes you have to fight demons, which are annoying because the whole screen is blurry and they blend in with the fire. They are very much based upon Japanese horror, and even the sound design is reminiscent of it. When this game was being made, remakes of Japanese horror films were popular, which gave Monolith the idea. As the story progresses, we learn that Fedel was raised to become a telepathic military commander as part of the Armachan Technology Corporation. Why on earth would anybody in their right mind do this? I mean, it's a neat idea to have your commander literally command his troops, but didn't you for a second think, hmm, maybe we shouldn't try and do this. I mean, after all, he has a whole army that he could use against us, and he is supernatural, so maybe we just shouldn't do this? <sighs> We also learn that Armour is actually the mother of Fettel, and we also learn that the Point Man is also the son of Armour Wade. And this is supposed to explain why his reflexes are so amazing. <sighs> really? It couldn't just be, oh my god, he has crazy reflexes. No, it has to be, oh yes, special powers. Great. So apparently Armour Wade was gifted psychic powers at birth, and as such, suffered nightmares and was attuned to negative emotions present in the people around her. 
Her father then took her into the Armachan Technology Corporation where they experimented on her. This is all while she was just three years old. They inducted her into Project Paragon where they tested her psychic powers and she passed all the tests. They then went on to find the source of her powers. When Alma was five, she tried to stop the experiments and even set fire to the Project Origin facility and attacked the scientists experimented on her. They wanted to keep testing these powers without her being able to attack the staff, so they kept her sedated. Here's where the Point Man and Fed'll come into this. Alma was recruited into Project Origin, which aimed at creating psychic super babies. No, that was literally the whole objective of Project Origin. Alma was locked into a vault, which was a spherical vault located deep inside the Project Origin facility. You can actually see it in the game right here. Alma was impregnated twice with prototypes created from her own DNA combined with the Origin researcher's DNA. She then gave birth to the Point Man at 15 years of age and then Fedel a year later. Alma eventually merged her mind with Fedel when he was 10. This caused ATC to pull the plug on Alma and remove life support from the vault. Alma then died six days later, but her psychic energy still lingered on, fueled by the hatred of her spirit. Not much happens for around 20 years, except for the fact that anyone near her corpse would feel ill and thus the city was abandoned. Then the game starts. You got that all up to speed? Good. I mean, it's an interesting backstory, but a lot of this was done just so they could explain why the Point Man's reflexes were so good, which, as I said before, it's not necessary. So towards the end of the game, Point Man kills his brother Fedel, which then shuts down the replicas. Gary Oldman then tries to free Alma. Alma then tries to kill the Point Man. Why are you trying to kill your son? Because he wasn't telepathically linked with you? I don't really see much reason for Alma to try and kill her son. Because of this, Point Man blows up the reactors, fights some demons, and then escapes. And then BOOM! Massive explosion. Well, uh, this looks familiar. At least we know where the inspiration for Call of Duty 4 came from. Then there's a cutscene after this where Point Man survives. Uh, okay, now this is getting silly. How does the Point Man survive a nuclear explosion? I know he was not at ground zero of the explosion, but he's still in a radius where he's gonna die. I mean, earlier in the game he survived an explosion when he went flying out a window, but at the same time you could just use the excuse that the explosion wasn't powerful enough to kill him, it was only powerful enough to blast him out the window. Here, it's literally a nuclear explosion that he survives. Anyway, you're picked up in a helicopter by Sergeant Johnson from Halo, no, literally, it's the same voice actor. And all seems okay until this happens. What about Alma? What happened to her? What was that sound? Well, damn. That's actually one good cliffhanger. I actually don't mind it. I mean, our main objective throughout the game was to stop Fedel, and we did that. Plus, I think that's one of those stories where no matter what you do, the evil is always going to win. So, I think Alma appearing here at the end makes sense. Despite the game ending on a cliffhanger, it does feel very conclusive, which is something I cannot say much when it comes to cliffhangers. After the credits, Nick Fury appears. <laughs> nah, just kidding. We get a phone call between two mysterious people explaining what happened and that the project is under control and that they deem the Point Man a success. Ah, oh, yeah, it looks under control to me! Overall, Fear's story is, like I said, meh. For most of the story, nothing happens, and even when something does happen, it's mostly just there to pad it out. The only parts of the story I find interesting are the beginning and the end. Everything in between just kind of bores me, but at least the gameplay is phenomenal. Fear is probably my favourite first person shooter ever and I find myself replaying it a lot, but it has issues, like any game does. I know a lot of people aren't very happy with where the story went in the sequels. I mean the main thing that annoyed me is that instead of making Alma a creepy and sadistic character, they made her a very, well, uh, let's just say sexual character which doesn't really fit in line with how the character was previously established. I will talk about the other Fear games another day, especially Freer, stupid title, but I think the first game stands well on its own. The weapons are fun to use and the enemies are fun to fight against. It has some really good AI and the level design is great for the most part. Even though the story kind of sucks, at least they don't throw cutscene after cutscene in your face. I mean, there's maybe less than 10 cutscenes in the whole game and for the most part, you're always in control. I like the bullet time mechanic too. Shooting enemies' limbs off and seeing debris fall from the walls and sparks fly around is just so badass. But I have seen Bullet Time done better in another game. A game that I will be talking about very soon.
Well that was a long video and it took a lot of research to make. Many other people out there have made great videos on fear. People like Late Night Gaming, White Light, Mandalore Gaming, Grimbeard, Gaming Pastime, and Noah Caldwell Grievous. I don't know if that's how you actually pronounce his name. Anyway, I'd recommend checking out these videos which are linked in the description. And also, I recommend checking out these four videos on artificial intelligence by AI and games. They are really good and they were very helpful in the making of this video. I would also like to thank my Mame Nia for helping me out with the thumbnail. He didn't like the original thumbnail I had made, so he made a new one and I changed it up a bit, so thanks buddy. I would also like to thank my subscribers as I recently hit over 100 subscribers. I appreciate you all watching my videos and I'd love to hear your thoughts on fear and some of your favourite memories you had while playing it. In the meantime, this is where I get off.